and welcome to Using TaxCalc for Stress-Free Filing. I'm Andy North, I'm the CMO here at TaxCalc and I'm joined today by Rushton Games. Mm -hmm. Rushton. Hi, I'm Rushton Games, I work in the customer support team, so if you've called up in the past you may have spoken to me already. So I just assist customers with any queries they've got relating to the software, so I take calls and answer emails to help out with those. And as you might expect, it's a very busy time, so we're grateful to have Rushton uh, here with us. Um, so the purpose of today is to um, run through how you would use TaxCalc to produce a tax return, um, what you can expect and tricks and tips ar around using it. It's really aimed at anyone who's using TaxCalc for the first time or who, if you just need a refresher, um, we're, we're, we're open to all, all comers. Um, this session also is particularly designed for users who are in practice, uh, so we're going to be approaching this with a slightly more complex tax return in mind, and we're going to skip over some of the more basic functions that you're probably all used to, but obviously if you do need help with those, uh, you're welcome to ask questions. Um, the session will be recorded and we will be sending a recorded version of this to everyone who is registered and it will also be available on the TaxCat website. Um, and please add any questions, there's a box where you can uh, email questions in and we will try and take as many of those as we can uh, towards the end of the session. Um, and for the purposes of this, this demonstration, I'm going to be, uh, I've put my acting socks on today. So I'm going to be playing the part, we've, we've invented a character called Aaron Brown, who's an IT contractor. Um, and he's going to be completing his um, tax return with the help of Rushton, his accountant. So hopefully you'll be able to sympathise and empathise with what's going on. Um, so let's get into it, Rushton. Yeah, um, it. I'm, I've, I've turned up, I'm your client, and I need your help. Yeah. Okay, so I think in the first instance, we'll run through the tax return in the simple step format. So for those who don't know, simple step is the format in which it's a bit more like the HMRC online tool for filing your tax return. It will ask you a series of questions. You tick the boxes which are relevant to you and anything that's not leave unticked and it will skip past it. But you can always go back at any stage to if you realise you've missed something out. So we'll probably go through it in a simple step format and then once we've got to the end, switch to HMRC forms mode. So if I click on that now, you'll see it's just another alternate way to enter the same information. So HMRC forms mode is just like a, a way where it basically shows you the full form, the, the actual form that's submitted to HMRC. So if we switch back to simple step for now, the first screen we've got is filing clients returns online so in this session, we're going to focus specifically on self-assessment returns, and then it just gives you some information about printing and paper filing your return. So the, the first thing to note is we have this Fetch Taxpayer Data banner at the bottom. So if we click on that, this gives agents a chance to fetch their taxpayers' data from HMRC. So anything that HMRC will obviously have record of, so pension income, employment income figures, and newly the self-employment in income support scheme grant. So what you would do is enter your agent credentials, just like you were logging into HMRC, and then once it's authorised, we're not going to do it now, but once it's authorised, you'll be able to fetch your taxpayer data. So if you're an agent for Aaron Brown, it will show any employment income schedules he has, for example, and you'll just be able to import those into the return. There, ha there have been some issues with that, though, haven't there, with uh, us being able to actually connect into <coughs> HMRC, I think? Yeah, exactly. So quite often you can, you can be authorised, but HMRC haven't actually released that information yet, so the authorisation could be successful, and it could return a fetch with no information. And that's not because of anything you've done wrong or even the software's doing wrong. It's just that HMRC haven't made that information available through the API yet. They say they intend for it all to be available kind of between June and September, but quite often you get to the January stage and, and some taxpayers' information still isn't available. 
Okay, so let's get into so Aaron Brown. Um, very broadly, he's a, had a couple of roles this year. He ran his own company, uh, an IT services company, but then um, changed and became a full-time employee halfway through. He did some foreign work uh, overseas. Yeah. Um, he had some bank interest to declare and some dividends too. Um, and was also disposed of a property this year and has some pension issues. Um, so there's, it, it, it's, it's perhaps a slightly more complex return that you're probably more familiar with. Um, help me, Rushton. Yeah, so I need your help. <laughs> so if we just start making our way through page by page, so if we go to the next step, so the first section talks about importing joint income. So this is mainly for if you have a spouse where you have joint income. So for example, you might both let out a residential property or have some interest from the same source where you've already done the first return, so this would be the second return, and you can press the import joint data button and that will allow you to import the same figures that are on the spouse's return, saving you the time of inputting them yourself. So this doesn't apply for you, for Aaron Brown, Not for I Aaron. believe. So we'll skip on to the next step, but that's how you would import joint income. So after that, we just the basics. So we're just talking about personal information here, name, date of birth, national insurance and UTR numbers if you have them. And then if we go on to the next step, this way you can enter your address and select which tax rates you're subject to, whether that be UK rates for England. Well, and on the next screen, we talk about the tax office address, which you'll notice is blank. So it's, it's important to note that we, you don't necessarily need to fill that in to submit the return because HMRC will generally have record of your tax office. Okay. So, moving on to the income schedules. Yes, okay. So I worked um, as a contractor until um, the end of 2020, so 31st of December. Yeah. I then got stopped doing that and began become work as a full time employee. Okay. So, um, so, so what we'll do is we'll. This is a list of all the income sources. So we'll only tick the ones that apply to us. That way, we won't be shown all the pages that we don't need to enter information on. But if we ever discovered we missed a page that needed to be included, we could always just go back to this step and retick it. So we're saying you're employed. And did we say you did some self-employment work throughout the year as well? That's right, yeah. Okay, so we'll tick the two boxes that are applied, and then that will take us to those two sets of pages. So if we go to the next step, then we're on to the employment. So what was the first employment so schedule the, you had there? The employment the schedule will be, for, uh, I worked for Brown's IT Services as a, as a director. Okay, and uh, you say as a director, so as a director. we'll tick the box here for a director. If there's any boxes that we don't discuss, it's because they're not relevant to this return and they're probably quite self-explanatory and that we, we don't need to go through them in depth. So if you ceased being a director before the end of the tax year, we need to enter the cessation date. So, so that was the 31st of December, 2020. Okay. So we'll pop that in there. And then, did this employment finish? No, that's, yeah. So now if we go on to the next step, now we can start talking about the, the figures from your P60 or P45. Okay, so just from, from, from the director's salary? Yeah. Where, where the director's uh, income was uh, 40,000. Okay. And then no other income from so any tips, for example, presumably not? No, unfortunately. Well, yeah. They never, never tipped me for <laughs> no. IT services. Okay, so any tax we had deducted from that? Yes, 5,500. Okay, so you'll notice at the top um, where the yellow box is, there'll be a constant running total of the tax and national insurance due from the income. So you'll see when we entered the 40,000, that rose from zero to 5,500. And now when we enter the 5,500 tax paid, that will reduce back down to zero. So, uh, so that will be all of that for that employment. No, no benefits received from the employment. 
no, no. No, but if, if there were any, we would enter them on this screen. So if we go to the next step. No expenses from the employment either. Uh, no, no, that was all um, relatively straightforward. Um, it would be worth pointing out the fact that you'll notice the uh, the number of icons uh, that follow on to a lot of the fields. So occasionally you'll have a wand. That indicates, as I think Rushton just showed up, a wizard, yeah. uh, which allows you to expand through to complete more complex. So it's, it's what what feeds into that uh, to that number and it'll talk you through that and we can come on to that shortly yeah exactly there's not any in this instance but for example if we look at the expenses for the employment business travel and subsistence we can click on this wand here and then there's a, a wizard for how we'd work that out so because we clicked on the travel one there's a, a wizard for mileage for example that doesn't apply in this case but it, it's there for when you need it uh, you've then also got the notes function. Yeah, so if we click on the notes here, that just allows you to make kind of notes for yourself more than anything. And then the question mark always refers to the knowledge base. Yeah, so that gives you help within the return. So that this just opens within the program itself, kind of an extract around the, the page you're on. So this is business travel and subsistence. So it gives you some information on there around what should be included and how it works if you get stuck there. So now if we go on to the next step, we get the option to add an additional employment. So I believe you said once you finished with Browns, you became a full-time employee? I became an employee, yes. IT experts in the UK. Um, okay. I reached out and uh, I, I took a role with them as a permanent employee. Sure. Um, and then I received uh, 35,000. Okay. Uh, was, th was that as a director? Uh, no, that was just uh, as, yep. a, as a, uh, an employee. Sure. So we're saying 35,000. And then what was the tax due? The tax due is 4,486. No, okay. PAYE. So we'll notice off that income, the tax went up to 12,000, but that's because some of that will be at 40%, which is why it was higher than the last schedule. And when we take off the tax of, sorry, could you remind 4, me of the 4,486. So that will probably be the basic rate tax due off that, but now it's combined both of the schedules. Some of that will be taxed at a higher rate, which is why we've still got some tax due. So if, as we move through the pages, there's no other benefits in this employment or expenses? Um, nothing, but are there any, what, what particular ones would you draw everyone's attention to? So I suppose company cars are quite common. So right, again, there's a box with a wizard next to it. So if you had a company car and we open the wizard for that, you can fill in the make and the model and that will give you your car and fuel benefits. And the same if we had a van. And then if we go to the car details, that's another breakdown of it as well. So, and it, it could be based off the emissions as well. So if it's for zero emissions, you would just enter zero in there. Let's close that. Picture of very, very basic employment. There was no, no yeah. nothing <laughs> in particular there. So that should no, be all exactly. fairly straightforward. Yeah, so now we've done the employment schedules. As we tick the self-employment as well as that, it's taken us to the self-employment pages. So the book sure dates. So presumably it was just the normal tax year? It was a normal tax year up until the 31st of December when that was dissolved. Um, there was also some uh, overseas income as well, don't forget. Yeah, sure. So the overseas income was the self-employment income, wasn't it? Um, that will be part of the self-employment income. Yeah. yeah, so what we do first of all is we enter it in the self-employment pages and then when we get to the overseas section, we essentially link the two pages together and then you'll see how they link when we get to that section. Let me pop the right date in there. So what was your turnover for the self-employment? It was uh, 40,000.
Okay, so if we go on to the next step now. So this just talks about whether we'll be, this is what determines whether we'll be using the short or the full form. So if your turnover was over 85,000, you would use the full form. That's kind of the main condition around that. As our turnover was 40,000, we then check if any of these instances occur as well, which in, so if you can read through those, but I think in this instance, none of them will be true. So we'll leave the box unticked and proceed with the short form. So did we have a business name for this or is it just trading as yourself? It was, it was Brown's IT Services. Okay. And it was IT in the description. That's right. And then if we could enter a principal postcode not, not necessarily for where the work was done, but so HMRC would know where to contact. RG12 to YP. Right, so the date your book started. So that was the, um, that, that would be from the, yeah, just. Just in line with year, the tax yeah. year. So again, we'll enter. So this is separate to where we entered the dates before. This is more specifically if the trade started after the tax year or ended before the end of the tax year, whereas before the, the dates were around the, the period of the return itself specifically. So, but, so we can talk about the cash basis here. So most people tend not to use the cash basis. So most people would use traditional accounting, which we call the accruals basis. So that's the idea of that any income you received isn't taxed as it's been received as such. It's more when the invoices were rendered. So if your income was invoiced but not paid before the end of the year, then we would use, we would include it as part of the accruals. Whereas if we were using the cash basis, then it would purely be based on the whether you receive that income or yep. not by the end of the tax year. So how have you accounted for your... So I'm using the accrual system. Okay, so we'll leave that box unticked and then we'll go on to the next step. So did you receive any other income other than the 40,000 from the turnover? Um, the uh, bank interest I have Yeah. To declare. Okay. Um, and then there's the dividends. Yeah, well. sure. Okay, so that's separate from this trade. And then did we have any expenses within that foreign self-employment? Um, no. no. Oh, two, yes, uh, there, there was, in fact, there was £250. Okay, sure. And what did that relate to? That was just flights. Okay, sure. So if we use the car, van and travel. So again, we can use the wizard here to select, well, we can type whether it's car, van or travel if we just want to provide a bit of okay. further information. So. So £250, and then that totals up to our £250 at the bottom of that screen. So, I'd, and there we can see our profit, 39750 So that was just the one self-employment, wasn't it? That's right. Okay, so we've not, it's important to note, we've not stated anywhere that that was a foreign self-employment yet. We'll get to that when we get onto the foreign pages. So for now, for the self-employment pages, we just need to enter the income and expenditure. Okay. So I don't have any pension income, but um, <coughs> a lot of people do. So. Yeah. So as you've not got any yourself, we won't take any of these boxes. And if we go to the next step, it goes straight past it. But if you were, say, to have pension income, you can tick whether it's taxable state pension, and then you can enter the information on the next page. As it's not, we'll just go back and untick the box. And the same if it was a private pension, we could go to the private pension section and then we can enter the name of the payer, the PAYE reference, and then the gross amount and any tax that would have been deducted. So if we go back, remove that tick, remove the schedule, and then we can move on to the other income section. 
So this is where it will come together a bit more in terms of the foreign self-employment. So you said you had some interest and some dividends. That's right. So um, I had some untaxed, uh, untaxed interest from yep. Santander, <coughs> um, okay. which came to a thousand. Right, sure. So we'll tick that top box to say that we had UK savings. And then you also had the foreign income as well. That's right, uh, which was 10,000. <coughs> sure, okay. So if we go to the next step there, that will take us to the savings and investment screen. So we're saying in interest from a UK bank or building society, and we're saying dividends from UK companies. So that my, my company had 20,000 in dividends. Sure, okay. So the untaxed UK interest you said was from Santander? That's right. So again, we can use a wizard to enter this information. And it's particularly handy if you had more than one form of interest. So let's say you had NatWest as well, then it would total the two up. We've, we've just got one in this scenario. So we're not going to enter the account number, but you can also enter that if you want to distinguish the difference between multiple sources of interest from the same bank, for example. And we said, how much did we 1, say? 1,000. This is UK interest, so we're not going to tick the foreign interest box. So now we close that, we can see the entry in the yellow box there. So now if we go to the next step, we can see dividends and other qualifying distributions from UK companies. So again, if we click on the wizard, we can type in the name of the company. Did you say that was from Browns? That was from Browns IT Services. Okay. And we'll just pop dividend as the description. And we don't need to enter the number of shares, but again, you can. So we'll just, en and the same with the payment date. So for now, we'll just enter the amount. It's 20,000. Which is 20,000. And again, if we had multiple sources of dividends, we could add another row and then populate the information there. And that would top up to the yellow total at the bottom. So if we close that schedule for now, we can see the 20,000 there. So if we go to the next step, that will now take us to our foreign income section. So as we stated, this is foreign self-employment. There isn't a tick box that says foreign self-employment, but for any foreign employment or self-employment, it would be foreign income from a job, business or other income not listed as above. So we'll just tick that bottom box there and we'll also tick the foreign tax credit relief in case you were taxed in that foreign country. So <clears throat> this is where we link the self-employment information that we entered earlier with the foreign tax paid. Right. So if we look at the page number and look at the help sheet, this will tell us what page number we need to enter to link it with the previous page. So for example, if it was employment, we would have entered E1, but it was self-employment for us, and we use the short form, so we'll enter SES1, and then that will link the foreign tax paid with the source of self-employment income. So SES1, and what country was this? That was when I was out in uh, <coughs> Austria. Okay. So if we go to select a country for a code, we can just type in the name of the country and that will give us the code. So AUT for Austria. Yeah. And how much foreign tax was paid on that? Uh, £1,800. Okay. And then the taxable amount which that income was from? Was the um, 10000 Okay. Right, so now we've entered that there. If we go to the next step, that will show us the foreign tax credit relief, which is 1800. So the foreign tax credit relief is the lower of the UK tax and the Austrian tax in this scenario. So it calculates what both would be and it gives you a foreign tax credit relief of the lower of the two. Okay. So, and then that's the foreign income. It's really as easy as that. <laughs> that was easier than I thought. <laughs> So here we talk about any other income and tax losses. So if you had any other income or tax losses, you tick this box. 
I'm not sure if you do in this instance, but we'll, we'll look through the page anyway. So any other income talking about property income dividends or real estate investment trusts would be declared in this top section. I don't believe those apply to you. Not for property income, although I did <coughs> sell a property. Yeah, Which we're okay. going to come on to. Exactly, we'll come on to that very shortly. And if you had any income tax losses from a previous year as well, those would be entered in this bottom section here. So for now, we'll go back and we'll untick this box. So tax reliefs and allowances. Were you contributing towards a pension in the year? Um, yes, <coughs> I was. And that was, I paid in a gross of 50,000 into my pension. Okay, so for the 2021, the annual allowance was 40,000. And we believe the contribution exceeded that, so we'll tick that box there as well. Uh, were you doing any marriage allowance transfers? Uh, no. 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 But we, c we can still touch base on that, so I think we'll tick that box just so we can go through on so that, because that's something that comes up for people as well, but then we can always go back and take that out. So if we go through now to the married couple's allowance, just go back a second. The marriage allowance one we wanted. So if you're transferring your personal allowance, you would need to tick this box and enter the net details of the person you're transferring it to, so your spouse. And if you're in receipt of the allowance, you would just tick the box at the bottom and then the tax figure would change. It won't in this circumstance because the income's too high to, to be in receipt of the allowance. So for people who can claim or transfer the marriage allowance, you get 10% of the personal allowance, and that's regardless of whether the spouse only had 10% remaining, or in fact the whole allowance. You can only transfer a maximum of 10% of it. So we'll just go back for now, and we'll un that box has unticked itself now. So if we go on to the pension contribution, Please remind me of the contribution you made. So I made 50,000 gross, and then there was uh, a net of 40. Okay, so if we type in the net, it fills in the tax for us because it knows to yeah. add an extra, right. yeah, it knows the percentage. So we close that schedule there, and then that's entered in there for us as well. So now on to your disposal that you've been Eager to eager to talk about yes, I was I, I was uh, probably <coughs> in, in bizarrely round numbers. Yeah, uh, I, I bought a property <laughs> in 1985 um, uh, for a hundred thousand pounds. Okay, um, and sold it uh, in 15 years later uh, for precisely two hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> what a coincidence! Um, yeah, I know it was it was fortuitous. Um, so I paid some tax on that, sure. and I'd like to have that recognised. Um, so yeah, how do we how do we handle that? Okay, so firstly, we'll tick the box to say we've disposed of an asset. If you have any qualifying entrepreneurs relief to bring forward, that can be entered there. So first of all, we'll select the type of asset. We can choose from listed or unlisted shares, UK residential or non-UK residential property, any other type of property, yeah. trust gains or carried interest. So was this a Res UK residential? UK residential property, that's right. Okay, so we'll put a brief, de brief description as a house. And then what date did you acquire this property? So it was bought in <coughs> on the, the 1st of April, 85. Okay. And um, the 1st of June, 2020, I sold it. Okay. Very precise. And, and what was the initial cost of that property? So it was 100000 when I bought it. Okay. And it's important to note that if it was purchased before the 31st of March 82, you would need to use a market value rather than the cost. So the disposal proceeds, they were exactly double that, weren't they? Yes, <laughs> precisely. I made, I made 100000 profit yeah. on that. So at the moment that's showing a 100,000 loss as soon as I enter the 200,000 disposal I'm not sure I sold proceeds. at the right time. No. I, I, <laughs> so we can see that's now generated a gain of 100,000 pounds. And you mentioned, did, 
paying tax on that already. I'd already paid 13,500. I did that when when I did, made the transaction. Yeah, sure. So for those of you who don't know, um, around a year and a half ago, they brought in the capital gains tax disposal property returns. So it was then required by law that you had to fill in a property disposal return within 30 days of selling your property. That's not available through any software providers. HMRC only accept that online on their systems. So that needs to be submitted within 30 days of the disposal. And then any tax that you pay, you pay then, and then you enter the amount of tax paid on the return and it will reduce your tax liability for the year as shown above. So that's reduced by 13,500. So were there any other reliefs? Uh, yeah, I wanted to claim, I've heard about the private residence relief and right. I'd like to claim that. Okay, so you've worked out your relief and how much relief are we claiming for 40, that? 40,000. Okay. So any other reliefs are also shown on this page, and this page isn't specifically relating to residential property. Some of these reliefs refer to other types of gains as well. So if we go to the next step, we get a nice disposal summary where we can just briefly check that those figures are correct. Those all look to be right to me. And then if we go to the next step, we can add any further disposals that we have. But I don't believe we have any this time around, do we? No, no. Okay, so this talks about any losses brought forward. As we discussed earlier, there's, there's no losses to bring forward in this case. So working out your tax. So you, you didn't have any self-employment income support scheme grants, did I you? I didn't, no, it was still quite busy, but yeah. a lot of people did, so exactly. it might be worth looking into that. So if, if you, well, your client had received any self-employment income support scheme grants for self-employment and you entered a, a figure into the box on the relevant page, so on the self-employment short form, for example, then this box would be ticked by default. So it would already tick it for you, so you, you don't need to remember to do that. And then once you go to the next step with that ticked, you would then tick to say that that income has been considered when calculating the profits, as the return does that. And then any incorrectly claimed grants would also go down here. So any grants other than SEISS in the top three boxes, and then the self-employment income support scheme grant in the bottom box. So let's go back and uncheck that for now. Did you have any other tax? So like student loan, for example? I did. There's a student loan. Um, okay. And um, I've already had uh, £1,000 was deducted by the employer IT right. expert. Okay. So we we'll take the student loans and go to the next step. So do you know which plan you were on? Uh, plan 1. Plan 1. So if we change this to Plan 1, that will produce a tax charge at the top based on how much tax is due from being on plan one, which is proportionate to the amount of income you've earned. So it applies a tax rate based on that. Right. And you've already had a thousand deducted by one of your employers. That's so right. that thousand pounds then comes off the additional tax that was due. As we could see that said five nine seven two before the employer deduction, we add in the thousand and that comes off that. And that's really all there is to it. Okay. <laughs> So payments on account, this is the bit that will <laughs> stop the panic of having a £25,000 tax bill. Right. <laughs> because presumably you've paid some of that already. I have, yes. So I, was, I made payments in January and uh, June. Yeah, so if we go to the next step, what amounts did we have due and paid for January and July? Um, I think it was 5000 each. Okay, so if we enter those in the amounts due, and then the amounts page. You'll notice that the tax at the top of the screen doesn't change because that tax is purely generated based on the income received rather than any tax paid. We'll see how that comes off a bit further on in the return. So we've entered those payments in for now. Class two national insurance is 
calculated for us. If we wanted to override that calculation, we click on the wand, tick the override box. If we change that to zero, for example, we would see that reflected at the top. But for now, we'll reset that back to normal. So if we go to the next step, we've got a summary of our tax due. So you'll notice the amount due for the 31st of January is the balancing payment is the 25,000 less the tax that we paid in January and July. And also the two payments on account due for next year will be slightly under half of the tax calculated at the top. So the, the things that would have stop that from being half so class 2 NIC isn't included in the payment on account calculation and neither is the student loan so that's why it's slightly under half so if we go to the next step now it just talks about agent details and refunds we've not allocating a refund so we'll skip through this and then we're at the check and finish screen so check and finish is, um, it, it might be worth talking through, but a, um, a unique feature of TaxCount which uh, will automatically go through and pick up any areas where you uh, failed to complete the right uh, details or indeed there's anomalies, right? It will yeah. pick up if there are particularly high figures or low figures that, that seem anomalous. Yeah, exactly. So we've got three different types of error messages. We've got the blue ones that are more for your consideration and they're just a reminder of things. So for example, if you had any child benefit, there's just a reminder to, to fill in that section because your income's over 50,000. So it's not necessarily a, a mistake you've made, it's just something for you to consider. We have the orange error messages, which again, won't necessarily affect you filing the return, although it does say to check them before you do try and submit the return. So for example, entering a PAYE reference, that's quite important. We will need to have that entered. It says if you don't know it, just enter the three zeros backslash N, and then that will be accepted, and then that message will disappear. And then there's also another one just about the branch sort code, but we're not really claiming a repayment, so that's fine. And then the more serious error messages are the red ones. So for example, if we remove the UTR number from the return, we will see a red check and finish error message, which is telling us you must enter it to be able to submit the return online. So we'll just pop that back in. But it'll also pick up numbers if the ratios are out with expected norms. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the programs tend to do the calculations itself, so there won't be many of those. That's more kind of the errors on submission of the right. return, where they kind of check the calculations. So what we can do now is we could switch back to HMRC forms, yep. and we can go through the return and see how it looks on there. Okay. So this gives us more of a sight of what HMRC will receive. So we've got the personal details again, tax details, we've not filled in the tax office, payments on account, importing joint data which obviously we don't have and then we get more onto the main return so this is what HMRC actually see when we submit the return so we've got your details there the sections of what makes up your return so we've got two employment schedules a self-employment schedule a foreign schedule some capital gains tax so those are all the additional pages that we've added to the return Income, such as interest and dividends, pension income, other income. Tax reliefs, like paying into the pension, charitable income if we had any. The student loan calculation, the incorrectly claimed self-employment income support scheme and the marriage allowance that we've not opted for. And then this is more about if you've paid too much tax any other information. So some, at some points where we've used wizards, this will pop in the additional information for us. So that's why we fill out the wizards, because that will pop that in right. the additional information for the tax inspector. And then signing the return. And then we've got the additional information pages as well to the main return. 
So it's just other income, some of the more unusual stuff that we've not seen in this return. And again, we wouldn't have seen all of this using simple step because we wouldn't have ticked the box because it doesn't apply to us. Yeah, so simple step has skipped that past for us. Exactly. Okay. And then we get back to the employment so we can review the employment schedules, check everything looks okay. So we've got the income, the tax deducted, the name of the employer, the PAYE reference, the date you ceased, and we can see that you checked to say you're a director. And then as we go on to the second employment schedule, we've got the same sort of information. And then again, this takes, takes us through all, most of the pages, even the ones we haven't. So if we were a minister of religion, we would press new here, but there's no schedule there because we haven't we filled not. that in under simple step. Exactly. So we can review our self-employment schedule again here. So we had the 40,000 turnover, the 250 pounds expenses, and then that gave us our profit of 39,750. Foreign schedules. So again, if we wanted to override the foreign tax credit relief, we don't because we believe it's right. We could just tick that box there and then override the figure in the wizard. So if you prefer doing your tax return using HMRC forms, you can directly input straight into this. Exactly. You'd miss out on the simple step advantage. Exactly, yeah. So on page six, that's the section where we entered the foreign self-employment, especially the tax that was paid on it. So capital gains tax, we can go through and see what we've entered on here. We've got the residential property section which is the section we filled out. So we've got our disposal proceeds, the allowable costs, and then the gain and the tax already reduced from that. And then the other pages go on to talk about other types of assets that we've not entered. And then we are back to our check and finish screen. Okay, so thank you very much, Rushton, <laughs> because you've saved my life doing my tax return. <laughs> No with problem. very round figures, <laughs> uh, which was surprising. So do you want to just talk us through the actual filing? It's relatively straightforward. Yeah, of course. So once we've gone to check and finish and we're happy with everything, we've got the file online function here. We're not going to actually submit this now, but if we were to, we would just check that we've got the right government gateway, user ID and password there, and then we would just press submit and it would either file successfully or would have a filing error. <laughs> yeah, so, relatively so it's just a click of two buttons. Excellent, okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for spending your time uh, just talking us through that return. No problem. A um, couple of questions. Uh, one of our, um, uh, I think we may have lost some sound um, at okay. one point and um, we'd like to just re-go re through. Sure. Uh, the, um, where the COVID SEISS grant sure. would go. So we'll look at this from a self-employed perspective as a sole trader because that's where most of them will apply. So if we go to the self-employment pages, go back to the short income details, then go through next steps so we get to see all the relevant pages. We've got the other income section here, but it's n important to note that it says include COVID support payments, but not the SEISS. So quite a lot of people used to make the mistake of entering it in there. Right. So if we go to the next step to the adjustments page, the self-employment income support scheme grant can be entered in the third box here. And that figure would essentially just be added to the profits. So in some circumstances, there's incorrectly claimed grants. So if we, let's just say we have 2,000 of grant that's correctly claimed yep. and 1,000 that's incorrectly claimed, we would enter the 2,000 correctly claimed grant here and that will be added to the profit and therefore be taxed at the taxpayer's marginal rate of tax. And the unpaid, the if grant- If there was a, a, an honest error, yeah, exactly. The incorrectly claimed grant, the whole amount will be paid back. And that goes a bit further down the return. 
So we will just get to that section. So working out your tax. And then because we've entered the self-employment income support scheme grant in the self-employment pages, this box is already ticked. So go to next step and we would just enter the incorrectly amount claim there. So if it was a thousand, for example, we will notice the tax at the top will increase by a thousand. Right, so you're just paying that straight back. Exactly. Fantastic, thank you. And then um, another question, if a client has a uh, foreign pension income from teaching, say um, 35,000 euros with Italian tax deducted, Okay. where would you put that? So pension income uh, okay. in euros. So if we go to the foreign section again, so I believe if we go to other income, we've already got foreign income ticked. So we'll skip it to the foreign section, which is here. So again, it will be, it's foreign pension, did you say? Foreign pension income, yeah. So we will tick the box for foreign pension on here, and then that should take us to that before the foreign self-employment. So we select the country code. Did we say it was it's Italian? Italian, yeah. So if we just type in, oh, that's OT, IT for Italy, then it will populate the country code for us. We will pop in the pension amount. So did we say 35,000 as an example? And then you would enter the tax that has been deducted and ensure the foreign tax credit relief is ticked. Um, let's just say, for example, there was 7,000 foreign tax paid. And then when we go to the foreign tax credit relief, that's been increased. So we've got the two schedules there. Okay. So that's where it goes, thank you. No problem. Um, okay, so for, uh, this is about going back to the property disposal stuff. Sure. Uh, for CGT, does the software calculate the PPR relief and the lettings relief? No, so the software won't calculate that. You'll need to calculate those figures yourself and then enter them in the relevant boxes. So those calculations are done pre-filling in the tax return. Right. Okay, fantastic. I think we can probably leave everyone to completing their tax returns and wrap up at this point. Sure. So, um, Rushton, thank you very, very much. No uh, would you like, if you can just share some of the, um, uh, share with our audience how people can get hold of support? Yeah, of course. So if you need to get hold of support, firstly, the telephone number is 0345 5190 882, and then me or one of my colleagues will be answering those as quickly as we can. The website link is taxcalc.com forward slash support. You can find any useful information such as our knowledge base on there, as well as raise queries through the ticketing system on there. And then the email address to get hold of us if you'd prefer to email rather than work on the phone is support at taxcalc.com. And then one of us will get back to you. We aim for within 24 hours, but we're often a lot sooner. Wonderful. So thank you very, very much once again. Uh, I know it's no a very problem. busy time <laughs> and uh, your, your time is very valuable. Um, to everyone watching, um, I hope that was useful um, and I wish you a very, very uh, efficient and effective tax season as well as, of course, a happy Christmas and a happy new year.